Hey guys, welcome to Connecting the Dots, the podcast where we follow the breadcrumbs and try to predict where disruptions will take us. This video closes the deep dive about General Motors, figuratively selling America, shortly after getting saved by American taxpayers. If you haven't watched the first two parts, I recommend doing so before watching this one. There are links in the card above. The first two videos focused on the what and described several prices that GM paid throughout its dealings with SAAC. In this video, we'll try to determine whether, like many of you said in the comments, GM was right to do what it did, or whether, like many others insisted, GM's management figuratively sold America. During my extensive research, I used well over 200 articles, and my perspective constantly changed on many things GM did. Sometimes I opposed GM's actions, but other times I embraced them, because that's how capitalism works. However, this video will add some crucial pieces of information and shed a new light on everything we saw before. This final piece of data, which I called the GM pumping machine, shut the lid on my pondering and cemented my view that GM management was very wrong and should have handled things very differently. They should have, but they chose not to. So yeah, GM, and specifically Mary Barra, did figuratively sell America. Before we dive in, if you wouldn't mind hitting the like button, it helps share this video with a lot more people, so if you do, I truly appreciate this. And consider going to Patreon, where for as little as one buck a month, you can support the channel and get my exclusive Patreon-only newsletter. And now, buckle up and get ready, because we're in for a wild ride. Some parts are ugly and others are fun, but one thing I promise is that it won't be boring. Some of the viewers lashed at me in the comments, thinking that I blame SAAC in this story, while in their opinion, SAAC saved GM, not the other way around. For example, take a look at this comment by Joel. This is misleading. The owners of these U.S. automobile companies make more money and leave the profits in the U.S. The Chinese workers work hard to provide the cars and get blamed. A few other viewers were less polite than Joel, so I guess I misunderstood. For the record, let me clarify that in this entire story, I have nothing but respect for SAAC. They were smart. They played a long-term game, and they got rewarded for it. They didn't lie or cheat GM. They just used every step to gain leverage in a long-term game, and steadily progressed throughout the years. The only one I blame here is GM, so let's get to them. There are so many aspects to this story, and we could debate them for hours. So to cut things short, I will be lenient with them because this would save time and enable me to go straight to the part which is more serious and is where my beef with them really is. I started this series of videos following an article by Edward Niedermeyer called The Secret History of GM's Chinese Bailout. My plan was to just read out the article in the video and add a few comments, a quick and easy way to make a video. Niedermeyer is the same guy that wrote Ludicrous, the unvarnished story of Tesla Motors. And since I disagreed with his conclusions there and think that he completely misunderstood the company, I decided to check deeper here and found an endless rabbit hole which completely changed my perception. I started the first video thinking like Niedermeyer and blamed GM for being the first Western company to open its technological floodgates and give a Chinese OEM their latest cutting edge technologies. This is probably true and in my research even shows that GM started the technology transfer long before the 2008 bailout. However, having gone down the rabbit hole, I now support GM's decision to do this. Frankly, SAAC would have advanced regardless of GM, just like other Chinese companies did without GM connections. In 2008, Chinese car companies were far behind the West in technology, and now they are at the cutting edge. And this would have happened with or without GM. GM was early to realize this, and they're taking advantage of this, raked in billions and billions of dollars for them. This was a smart move, and good for them. And I blamed GM for closing or selling uncompetitive factories and exiting entire markets, like they did in Thailand, Australia, India, and Europe, and of divesting brands such as Opel, Vauxhall, and Holden. GM would say this was inevitable. These factories and brands were ancient. They were behind in technology, required lots of manual labor, and consistently lost money. Tariffs aside, it was much more logical to concentrate everything in one place, China and export from there to the rest of the world. I have reservations about this. For example, if producing in one place, which is China, better than producing locally in small markets like Thailand and Vietnam, why did SAAC do the reverse route and buy GM's factories in Thailand when GM pulled out? Why did VinFast buy GM's factories in Vietnam? 
And how did both companies make these local operations profitable? And if German and American workforce are too damn expensive, why do BMW and VW keep producing in both places? How can they be profitable? And if Opel is a constant money loser, how did Stellantis make it profitable only one year after buying it from GM? But debating whether GM should have closed losing factories would be falling into GM's hands when there are bigger fish to fry. Let's leave this point open and move on, because the real question we should be asking is how did these factories get there anyway? The answer is what I call the GM pumping machine. It is three parts, and here's how it goes. Let's say you're in the horse racing business, and you own a skinny, weak horse like in this picture. It's been ages since you won a race. Taking care of that horse is a problem, and someone approaches you and offers you a deal to buy a new horse and together start winning many races. If you decide to partner with that guy and enter your shared horse on different tracks than your own horse, I can't blame you for that. And even if you decide to sell your old horse to someone else and start entering the new joint ventured horse in races the old horse would have attended, I can't blame you for that either. But if this here was your old horse, and it was strong and award-winning, but instead of feeding, grooming, and training it, you starved the horse and let it decline to its current miserable state, I'd be furious as hell for that. So sure, GM did the right thing closing Holden and selling Opel and Vauxhall to Stellantis when they did, but I am damn furious they let them reach that position in the first place. Some of you might object to what I just said, but before we address them, let's go back in time to an era when Opel and Vauxhall rocked. In the 1980s, Opel and Vauxhall were on a run. Cars such as the Ascona and Cavalier, or Cadet and Astra, as well as their successors, broke sales records. GM Europe was a real cash cow, bringing in huge profits for the company. With that in mind, let's consider the article GM Europe, How to Get Something Right by Stephen Hokesh, published in February 1990 in the New York Times. Let's read this together. In hindsight, it's extremely eye-opening. They're the most profitable of the European car manufacturers, said analyst John K. Lawson. He estimates that GM Europe has a profit margin of 14 to 15 percent, or at least two points better than each of its five major competitors. Though GM sold only 1.5 million cars in Europe last year, versus 3.44 million in the United States, the division earned an estimated $2 billion, or half of GM's estimated total. Most of the rest of the parent's profit came from non-automotive operations. Unless GM can reverse its slide in the United States, where its market share has dropped 10 points since the early 1980s, to about 35%, the dependency on Europe is only likely to grow. And then, listen to this. Indeed, one risk over the next few years is that so much cash will have to go to North America that GM Europe will lose its momentum. The temptation will be enormous to bleed Europe dry and postpone model programs, said Daniel T. Jones, a professor at the Cardiff Business School at the University of Wales. That's GM Europe's major worry. As GM executives acknowledge, Detroit starved the company's European operations in the 1970s. Even in the 1980s, there was a limit to Detroit's generosity. GM Europe made some great cars, much better engineered than their American counterparts, and instead of investing money back in the division so it would continue to flourish, GM bled it dry, churning out barely modified, low-tech cars that trailed the competition and sold mostly to fleets. And it didn't stop there. Let's hear what my viewer, Raglan's Electric Baboon, had to say. This has been true for decades. Instead, they've been consuming and ruining other companies in between getting bailed out. My parents loved Sobs, killed by GM's crap management. I worked for Lotus, nearly killed by GM's crap management and basically given to Proton. I used to love Subarus, nearly killed by GM's crap management. And here's what my viewer David said. GM was exporting the profits out of Holden tax-free through transfer pricing. The last year they made a profit was the last year that Peter Hannenberger was in charge. He was the last guy that would tell GM Detroit to jump. And after he left, GM installed lackeys who had always listened to Detroit. Coincidence? I think not. In the later days, GM was forcing Holden to import wheels from GM Detroit for the VF Commodores, when they used to use the local wheel maker ROH Wheels for every previous Commodore, who was a cheaper wheel provider. There's only one reason to force your subsidiary to buy from you, from abroad, even though you're more expensive than the local guy, and that's for transfer pricing. So the first part of the GM pumping machine was bleeding divisions and subsidiaries dry, starving them of investments until they fell back so far behind that they were either sold or euthanized to end their misery. 
The second part of the GM pumping machine was emptying taxpayer pockets. After the bailout, many started calling GM government motors. But frankly, that's just the tip of the iceberg. They were government motors long before that, and they still are. Here's a question for you. Are you an American? Or maybe a Canadian? Australian, maybe? Or German? Are you British? Do you live in Spain? Belgium? Or maybe Hungary? South Africa, maybe? Do you live in Thailand? Or Korea? How about Argentina? If you are, congratulations. Please pat yourself on the back for your part in GM's success, because all these countries and many others paid GM subsidies throughout the years. GM is at the forefront of lobbying for taxpayer dollars. You know how politicians attack Tesla for taking a government loan, which it returned early with interest? Nobody mentions that GM was the one that lobbied hard for that government funding. They took far more than Tesla, and Tesla just applied to get this funding once GM arranged it. GM's method of operation was consistent. Part one of the GM pumping machine was sucking profits out of every profitable division and starving product development everywhere except China, where Sayak and Wu Ling paid over half the bill. And since starved operations barely held their weight, part two of the GM pumping machine was asking governments worldwide for subsidies and threatening they would pull out if these were stopped. Remember how GM closed Holden? Happened right after subsidies were stopped. Want to guess when Opel and Vauxhall were sold? Yep, once subsidies dried out. Holden, where are you today? Oh, look, I think it's a, a day of great shame for Australia. Uh, there was once upon a time in Australia where General Motors Holden accounted for almost 2% of our national economy. Today they're laying off 600, 800 people and it's you know not just the end uh, of, a, of a great Australian uh, business, but it's the end of an era, I think. It was only a few short years ago that General Motors was having 100,000 Commodores being sold a day. They had 400 a day rolling off the production line. So they were a very successful manufacturer in Australia. I think the history was they came looking for more money and the government said, no, uh, you need Australians to buy the car and vote with their feet. And you already received significant subsidies. We're not adding to it. And then that's when they threw the, the toys out of the cot and uh, progressively have walked away to the point today where the brand won't be on the street. This happened again and again. In other markets, too, GM lobbied for subsidies, and once they were gone, so was GM. A study by Fraser Institute, which checked subsidies in Canada between 1961 to 2013, placed GM at the fifth place in subsidies, bested only by four Canadian aerospace and defense companies such as De Havilland and Bombardier. But this counts only part of the subsidies. So if we include the $10.8 billion which Canada gave GM in 2009, GM skyrockets to first place, with about six times what the second place company received. In fact, they sucked much more taxpayer dollars than all other nine companies combined. We don't hear much about these subsidies, so you might think this was a thing of the past. I wish. In 2021, GM had an income of $9.8 billion, so clearly it can fund its own business. Yet in the USA alone, GM collected almost $170 million in subsidies. Why? If you think everybody does this, think again. In 2021, Tesla didn't take a single cent in subsidies. And Toyota, which makes about 1.6 million cars a year in America, took less than $1.8 million, or about 1% of GM's subsidies. But maybe this year is a fluke. So let's get back to COVID year. In 2020, GM had an income of $6.2 billion. Nice, right? But while media discusses Tesla's ZEV credits, which they get from other companies, not the government, nobody mentions that over 11% of GM's profits were $675 million they received from American taxpayers. And that's without counting Tennessee property tax abatements, whose size was undisclosed. And in 2019, GM had an income of $6.6 .6 billion, yet they collected just from American taxpayers over $615 million in subsidies, not including additional property tax abatements. And so it goes. Let's go back in time to check U.S. subsidies before the bailout. 2006, $215 million. 2007, $139 million. 2008, 528 million. All these are just partial numbers from the US alone and without considering the $50 billion bailout itself. Since GM starves its factories without investing in modern manufacturing methods or developing high-tech cars which buyers would pay a premium for, these factories can't generate profits without subsidies. 
It seems like throughout the years, GM operated many of them just as a way of sucking more subsidies. And once taxpayers in a certain country got fed up with paying GM and the subsidy stopped, GM showed them its tailpipe and exited the country. I have numerous articles from several countries showing how GM did this again and again, but it would take hours to go into details, so let's move on. Let me know in the comments below whether you'd like me to do a video on how GM did this with Holden and with Opal. So GM pumps money out of every profitable division and breastfeeds on taxpayer dollars worldwide. But what does it do with all that money? Dividends, of course. Since COVID hit, GM froze dividends. But until then, rain or shine, GM paid dividends like clockwork. In 2020, before COVID hit, they managed to give half a billion in dividends. Considering they received more than that in subsidies, despite being highly profitable, this means 80% of American taxpayer money was directly funneled to shareholders. Before COVID, they gave $2 billion in dividends in both 2019 and 2018. In both years, they were highly profitable, and in each of these years, over a half of a billion American taxpayer money were funneled directly to shareholder pockets as part of these dividends. And remember the bailout? In the 10 years between 1997 and 2006, GM funneled out to its shareholders over $36 billion in dividends. In 2007, they gave over half a billion, and in 2008, they still managed to give over $130 million before bankruptcy was imminent and they had to shut the funneling down. I do believe that reinvesting just a fraction of that into the company would have prevented the bankruptcy, but that's not how the GM pumping machine works. It takes money out of the company and out of taxpayers' pockets and funnels it to shareholders, not the other way around. A large American factory stopped production today after more than half a century. 1,600 workers at the General Motors plant in Lordstown, Ohio, are affected by this. Dean Reynolds met one man on his last shift there in tonight's Eye on America. I was hoping that it didn't come to this. Yeah, the last drive in, it's kind of bittersweet. I mean, what do you do from here? This may be the last time I pull up and park in this spot. Aaron Applegate has worked at the GM plant for 11 years. Today was his last shift. A little worried. A little worried? A lot worried. <laughs> in GM speak, Lordstown has been unallocated, meaning the Chevy Cruze that rolls off the line this week is the last car they're making here. The last of 16 million vehicles since it opened in 1966, and it's the largest of the four plants in the U.S. where GM plans to stop production this year. More than 3,300 hourly workers will be laid off indefinitely. That's 7% of GM's approximately 50,000 hourly employees nationwide. The cuts come as the automaker is reporting a near record $12 billion profit last year. Are you bitter? Oh, yeah. Aaron brought his wife, Jean Ann, and his four children here 11 years ago after his employer in Indiana shut down. I'm definitely, parts of me are very bitter. What makes you bitter is the fact that they're making profit year after year after year now, and we, we're not seeing that back. It's not um, as simple as a number. But GM employees are a number because they don't care. I mean, you're replaceable. GM is offering some workers transfers to other plants, and Applegate can apply, but it's complicated. His children include 13-year-old Austin, who has cerebral palsy, needs special care, and is slated for spinal <laughs> surgery at the end of the month. GM health insurance is key. Um, with my youngest son, he needs that. He has great nurses that have been with him for years, that know him, that know how to treat his seizures. We wanted to know what they would tell GM CEO Mary Barra, whose ordered cuts come in response to market demand for big trucks and SUVs. For her to think that she can play God and do whatever she wants to do with any GM family is wrong. I love living here. The friends, the neighbors, a community that I can call whenever anything goes on with that little boy, and they're here. And it is amazing, and I don't want to leave it. I don't want to. Today at the plant, Aaron was bolting brackets and finishing the trim just like every other day. But this wasn't every other day.
Some of the comments I got told me to get off GM's back for transferring its operations to China. After all, that's how capitalism works, right? Not exactly. In fact, GM might wave the capitalism banner whenever it's convenient, but in fact, they're the opposite of capitalism. Bailouts are not capitalism. Lobbying for subsidies is not capitalism. Funding politicians and messing with legislation is not capitalism. In fact, they are quite the opposite. Capitalism would have meant that GM should have gone belly up in 2008, Bailing the company out with absurd amounts of American, Canadian, and possibly other taxpayer money is the opposite of capitalism. And as such, it just reinforced GM's bad tendencies and confirmed that the GM pumping machine should be turned to max speed. Until very recently, GM continued to underinvest in tech. To this day, they continue lobbying for subsidies and actively meddle with legislation. The main problem with GM is that it became lazy a dirty company that has lost its moral compass years ago and is more interested in government than production. They lobbied hard to get government funding. They lobby hard to get favorable legislation. And they fiercely fight environmental regulations, safety laws, and tariffs that would force them to spend a cent more. They outsource most of their development to their JVs with SEAC and Wu Ling, where these companies share the costs and do a lot of the heavy lifting. They underinvest everywhere, and they suck money out of any profitable division and from taxpayer pockets and funnel it out as dividends. They are pure corporate greed, mixed with government-like laziness and love of taxpayer money. The news today couldn't have come at a worse time. Just weeks now until Christmas, and General Motors has now revealed it will lay off workers in Ohio, Michigan, and Maryland. Thousands of jobs and at least three vehicles will no longer be made. ABC's Eva Pilgrim is in Detroit tonight. Tonight, major cuts at car giant GM. Nearly 15,000 jobs eliminated, a whopping 15% of the company's workforce. In all, five plants slated to shut down by the end of next year, including those in Warren, Michigan, White Marsh, Maryland, Warren, Ohio, and Detroit. We're going to come back hard, uh, and we're going to try to convince them that a modern plant uh, in an area where you can get a good workforce uh, is an asset. GM citing a shift to focus more on automation and high SUV sales. The company announcing they're eliminating the low-selling Chevrolet Cruze, Volt, and Impala cars from their roster. Today, the president not hiding his frustration with CEO Mary Barra. I have not happy with what you did. That car is not selling. It's a Cruze, Chevy Cruze. It's not selling. But hopefully she's going to come back and she's going to put something. But I told her I'm not happy about it. The president also asked if increased tariffs due to a trade war are to blame. No, not tariffs. That nothing to do with tariffs. She says the car was not selling. GM acknowledges the tariffs aren't to blame for the cuts, but in June issued a stark warning that, quote, increased import tariffs could lead to a smaller GM. And tonight say the trade policy has cost them $1.4 billion. Let's wrap things up with two points to ponder. GM is the undisputed world champion in sucking taxpayer money. But whenever they close plants, exit markets, sell companies, and move production to China, they raise the banner of capitalism. But capitalism says that GM shouldn't have been saved. They should have been left to die. And capitalism also says that GM should not get the billions upon billions they receive in subsidies to this very day. Let me know in the comments below whether you think that after taking billions of dollars from taxpayers, maybe, just maybe, GM should be less trigger happy with closing factories and do their best to keep jobs in the countries that save them. And another point, GM just released its sales numbers for the first quarter of 2022 and results were dismal. Year over year, sales dropped 20%, and while GM can blame chip shortage, supply issues, and rising gas prices, the plain fact is that inventories are stacking up in dealer lots. The upcoming years will show a huge shift to EVs for which GM is ill-prepared, and it is highly likely that without government intervention, more massive than the hundreds of millions that they currently receive, GM will go belly up. Chances are that they'll ask for huge subsidies or another bailout. If this happens, let me know whether you think they should get bailed out again or just let capitalism do its thing. And don't forget to also let me know whether you'd like me to make a video showing why Opal, Vauxhall, and maybe, maybe even Holden could have succeeded had GM done things otherwise. In a moment, I'll show a terrifying story of how Bean County managers caused American automakers to starve the development of new cars. So stick with me as I quickly wrap things up. 
If you liked this series, please like and subscribe. And to support the channel, please visit my Patreon, where you will also get my patron-only newsletter. A huge shout-out to my latest patrons, Andy Hamilton, Crunch, Gilad Cohen, Adam S., Terry Gilliland, Scott W. Miller, Richard, and Fred Brickowitz. A huge thank you to all my patrons. You guys rock. You can follow me on Twitter, where I am Connecting no Dots. Until next time, I am Connecting the Dots, and you are amazing. And now, as promised, here's the terrifying story of how Ford developed the Fiesta Mark II. One of my favorite stories in the book, and it's a terrific book, by the way, Thank you. is you talked about the Fiesta development program in Europe, working with uh, Red Poling. Yeah. And the, the team came in and said, Red, we, we got to do this car and it's going to cost a billion one. And he said, OK, you can have 400 million. Go do it. And kept beating them down, beating them down. Yeah, well, that was, down. that was that was when in the part with I mean, Red Poling was may he rest in peace, but was an extremely difficult guy to work for and not always totally rational in his financially oriented decision making. I mean, he was he was often the guy who would be penny wise and pound foolish. But some of the lessons on toughness, uh, which I, I had a tendency to believe the teams, you know, naively. I was only a marketing guy. If they came and said, we've looked at this program, it's going to be uh, this was the second generation Fiesta. If they told me it was a, a billion, I, I would sort of say, well, are you sure? And they said, of course we're sure. We're presenting it. And said, oh, okay. Well, in that case, you know. And what, what we did with the Fiesta at Poling's insistence, second gen, because we didn't make any money on the first gen. Poling said, look, the, with the volume we've got, with if you figure the the variable cost of the car plus the fixed cost, but part of the fixed cost allocation, of course, is depreciation and amortization. He said, we can't afford to spend more than 400 million on this program. And I said, okay, tough challenge. I mean, it'll be a lot of carryover and so forth. And the, the, the engineering guys came, or the product guys came in with 1.1 billion. And I said, no, that's, that's not gonna work. You have to come back with 400. 400? That's not a new car. I said, well, you know, use your use your creativity, but that's what it is. And they came back in two weeks or three weeks and said, we've really gutted the program. We've had to give up a lot of stuff and so forth. And it's 800. And I said, what is there about 400 that you don't understand? I mean, I was being as, as tough as polling and everybody grumbled and said he's getting to be just like the chairman. But, you know, you're not running a popularity contest. You, you can't please people in situations like that. So they went away and ultimately they came back at 470 or something. And I said, it's not 400. And they said, well, the only way we can get to 400 is to not redo the front suspension. And the front suspension is the weak point of the car. It doesn't have enough travel. It's the number one customer complaint and so forth and so on. And uh, we need we need um, a new engine box to accommodate a, a new strut setup and with longer travel and so forth. So I went to Red and I said, look, they're at, they're at 470, but they need a new front suspension. And I agree, it's, it's a good deal. And Red said, well, I don't remember reading any magazine articles about the poor front suspension and how how many sales have we lost due to poor front suspension? And how about every everybody else's front suspension? He says, look, as far as I'm, is it a quality problem? No, but people just don't like it. He says, well, that's not a reason. Tell them 400. So I went back and said, no front suspension. And they crestfallen. And they went away. And darn it, in three weeks time, they came back and said, one of our guys devised a way where we can package an interesting new linkage. We don't have to change the engine box or the front end structure of the car. And it's, I think it was seven or 10 million. And at that point, I said, you got it. And I went to Red and I said, Red, I overran the 400 because we're getting the new front suspension for, I don't know, seven or 10 or something. And he said, well, okay, but you see what happens when you're tough. You, know, you made it sound like with polling, financial discipline was everything. Yeah. And he would be happier with a car that came in on budget, even though it was unsaleable and sold as a well, he, at a loss, he, rather than one that came well, in yeah, a little over and sold at a profit. Anecdote, famous anecdote, one of the tune-ups he gave me, he said, you know what your problem is? I said, no, what, Red? He says, your problem is if the devil came to you and said, if you overrun the cost objective by $50, I will reward you by making this the best car the world has ever seen and a bestseller. And you 
you'd take the deal. I said, for 50 bucks a car, you bet I would. <laughs> and he said, well, see, I wouldn't because the cost objective is sacred. You can't violate it. You've got to hang your hat on something. Well, that's just rigid thinking. And it was like well, there was one point where everybody in Europe with manuals was going to five-speed transmissions. And I said to Red, look, we need to invest in a five-speed transmission for the Fiesta and the Escort, at least. So Red, bless him, commissions a study with the finance guys to see how often fifth gear is actually used. <laughs> and it turned out to be, you know, what with urban, urban environments and the relative paucity of Autobahn driving, et cetera, et cetera. In most of Europe, fifth gear was probably engaged by the average owner, maybe less than 10% of the time. And so there was, during the 10% usage, there was a minute improvement in fuel economy, which didn't offset the added cost and price for the fifth gear. So uh, the, the net conclusion of the study was a uh, fifth gear makes no sense whatsoever because the, uh, the, the, the cost recovery in terms of gasoline savings do not pay for the extra investment that the customer has to make for the fifth gear. Uh, therefore, we're staying with, I said, Red, that may be, you know, that may be true, that, that may be factual, but that that's not the market perception. The market perception is with my fifth gear here, I save fuel. He wouldn't approve it. The same thing with the diesel engine for the small cars in Europe. And of course, diesels have been ubiquitous at the low end of the market in Europe for many decades. But this was just the beginning and Volkswagen was like selling 60% diesel golfs. And we wanted a diesel and the same analysis was done that showed that the customer never recovers the added cost of the diesel engine. And again, it doesn't matter if people think they're saving, if people will willingly pay pay an increment more for a diesel with the belief that, okay, I paid more for my car, but now look at the money I'm saving. And I remember against his advice, I was anointed chairman of Ford of Europe after he left and we were all out at Stansted Airport watching the G4 take off and the whole executive team was there and when the wheels were safely up and the flaps were up and the airplane was getting smaller and smaller in the sky, I turned to the guys and said, prepare the appropriation request for the five-speed in the diesel. <laughs> <laughs>